thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about uh, some work which has been going on in, uh, in my group at Sussex for some time. Um, now, some of you have seen me recently speak here at Nottingham, and, uh, and on which occasion I've presented some results related to um, renormalization group applications in quantum gravity. But today, I would like to talk about a related but different topic, which largely deals with applying those ideas to help our understanding of quantum aspects in black hole physics. Now, to be a bit more specific, so the starting, the starting point obviously, and perhaps that's a common denominator with quite a few of you in the audience is, hi, where is gravitation? Okay, and so we will be interested in understanding some aspects of gravitation in a regime where perhaps quantum corrections will be important. Now, there's one very funny link relating aspects of classical gravity with the notion of thermodynamics. Now that's something which came up in the 70s and has since then puzzled uh, many people, okay, how it comes that certain aspects of classical gravity have a perfectly one-to-one -one equivalent thermodynamical interpretation. Okay, and um, as you may know, that is something which has led to the notion of black hole thermodynamics and the notion of associating a temperature and even an entropy to classical black hole solutions in gravity. Now, when you speak about thermodynamics, yes, so you may think, you know, properties of a gas, and so we speak about not each individual particle in the, bus, uh, in, in the gas, but rather macroscopic properties such as the average energy, the temperature, pressure, okay? So immediately you probably feel reminded the notion of coarse graining underlying thermodynamics. Okay? Now if there is a link between thermodynamics and gravitation, okay, uh, surely there must be a link between this uh, notion of coarse graining and the notion of what is going on in gravity. Now, and in fact, you can close this circle by observing that indeed, in, in a, to some in, uh, to certain extent, some aspects of the physics of uh, gravity are also intimately related to a notion of a Wilsonian coarse graining, yes, and that is precisely. Um, this picture, this Wilsonian picture of quantum field theory, according to which you may integrate out momentum degrees of freedom from a fundamental path integral representation of your theory. Okay, and so if you ha imagine you had one such uh, path integral for gravity, once you've integrated out the high energy momentum modes from it, yes, you ought to end up with classical or with effective equations of motions which have classical gravity as their subtle point solution in the infrared. Okay? So there is a link uh, relating these notions with each other. Now, um, of course, what is depicted in blue here, this link is something which has uh, uh, raised a lot of interest in the past 15 years. Um, this is something which uh, is perhaps best known under the marker of asymptotic safety for quantum gravity, which uh, represents a research stream aiming precisely at finding a microscopic path integral representation, yes, which, is, uh, which still takes the metric degrees of freedom seriously as fundamental degrees of freedom, yeah, which however at high energies is not perturbative, but governed by a non-trivial fixed point. So, a lot of work has been done in order to figure out uh, whether this indeed is feasible and there are very strong indications existing to, uh, by now suggesting that this in fact is the case. So there is a very intimate link between these two aspects of uh, uh, gravitation and an underlying Wilsonian path integral representation. Okay, so perhaps the most advanced study in four dimensions uh, for such a fixed point search is, is shown here. You know, this is like uh, an action 
which is a polynomial in the Ricci scala for which a fixed point has been searched up to order of 35 Yes, 35 powers of the Ricci scala and the very stable fixed points of this are the fixed point coordinates, right, has been identified in, in this highly intricate system. So there's quite some evidence um, towards uh, the picture that um, improved path integral may actually be underneath a theory of gravity and thus this could be an object which may help uh, clarifying also aspects of gravitational thermodynamics and therefore aspects of uh, black hole physics. So what I will, would like to deal with today is to discuss this part of the picture, okay, um, which in essence means um, applying these ideas to the physics of black holes. Now to start with um, I will review a few features a few, a few very well-known features for classical black holes. Um, now, classical black holes, what are, yes, uh, are specific solutions to Einstein's theory of general rel uh, relativity. So they are uh, characterized by the existence of an event horizon. There's an associated area, A, which comes with this event horizon, and we know that say if you think of four-dimensional gravity, we know that the most general static black hole solutions for long-ranged forces are uh, the so-called Kerr-Newman black holes. For these, so for those we can just write down in a cert certain coordinate systems, we can write down these solutions. Okay, um, so they have Newton's coupling constant in it, they, they have uh, an abelian, uh, uh, the U1 charge parametrizing it. Okay, these solutions may or may not be rotating and they are characterized by a mass. Now, there are very powerful uniqueness theorems available which have been proven some time back, uh, which show that for each of these solutions there is a one to one relation between the area of the event horizon, A, and the mass, angular momentum, and charge of these black holes. Good. So, um, in a sense, to make it very simple, say, in a sense, once you know this function and these relations, you know um, essentially everything you need to know about these classical black hole solutions. Now, Classical black holes also have a few known issues. So what are the issues with classical black holes? First of all, uh, they tend to have curvature singularities at their origin. Now, um, from a physics point of view, that's something which is not quite acceptable. You would not expect nature to become singular. So you would expect that perhaps in an extension of the theory, possibly quantum gravitational corrections will heal and cure these singularities. Okay. Um, now, so that's something which is go technically going to limit predictivity of the classical theory. Furthermore, black hole spacetimes are known, classical black hole spacetimes are known to be geodesically incomplete. So not every test particle which you allow to run on its own classical trajectory, yes, will be able to evolve arbitrarily into its own proper time future. Okay, so there are trajectories which will simply terminate. Um, now, if you even look more carefully into these black holes, yes, you, one realizes that uh, you can associate a notion of temperature to these black holes. They will start radiating. But this temperature, technically speaking, can become arbitrarily large. Again, that's something uh, where you would expect that perhaps quantum gravitational corrections will take over this behavior. Okay, good. So, so much for the description of our classical black holes. Now, allow me to remind you of how these classical black holes uh, are related to a thermodynamical description. What I would like to do in this sequel is I would like to exploit 
this relation to put forward a proposal on how quantum gravity corrections are going to modify uh, the physics of classical black holes. So therefore let's first review how this comes about. Now this goes back to work by these gentlemen in the early 70s okay and it is largely based on a type of thought experiment so imagine you have a black hole of a certain mass okay where the mass is say large now imagine you take a small test particle of a small mass and you let you take this test particle and throw it into the black hole okay so after you have done it you will end up with a new black hole which has a slightly larger mass and slightly different parameters. Okay? So in order to describe this process infinitesimally, you may write down uh, how the change in mass of the black hole is related to the change of horizon area, the change of angular momentum and the change of charge. Okay? Now, this equation is what is predicted by the laws of general relativity. Okay? So you see appearing here the uh, surface gravity, kappa, which is the force of gravity at the event horizon. Okay? Now, in a sense, and what, what these gentlemen have noticed back then is that the form of these equations is very similar to uh, the laws of thermodynamics. So if you were to be writing down the first law of thermodynamics, it would look like, yes, the change of internal energy is given by the variation of the heat plus uh, chemical potentials uh, times uh, um, the uh, related conser uh, variation in the related conserved charges. Okay? So if I were to be identifying the inner energy with the mass of the black hole, the change of heat with um, surface gravity times um, the change in uh, horizon area and identify, I mean, these uh, chemical potentials with uh, um, electrical potential and uh, angular um, um, uh, momentum of inertia, yes, then we would have one-to-one -one equivalence between these two equations. Now, um, once you've identified this link, you may exploit it in order to define a notion of temperature for these black holes. So we have a first law of thermodynamics. We can now identify a reversible thermodynamic... I mean, if we view this or interpret this as a reversible thermodynamic process as temperature T, yes, we can link the change in heat over temperature with... Um, the change in entropy of our system. So therefore we learn the second law of thermodynamics, yes, the, uh, sorry, the other way around, the second law of thermodynamics therefore tells us that uh, the entropy, we may associate it an entropy to a black hole, and but that entropy therefore must scale proportionally to the area of the horizon. And on top comes you can also use this to identify the temperature as being essentially the surface gravity divided by some factor. <coughs> now later on, okay, uh, so combining these things you then of course find the famous formula which gives you uh, that the black hole entropy is given by uh, the area divided by four times Newton's coupling. Now a bit later uh, these relations have also been derived explicitly starting from a Euclidean path integral. Yes, in which sense, and when doing this, yes, uh, this entropy has the interpretation of a statistical entropy associated to that system. Good. So, um, um, what I haven't mentioned here. Uh, but which is also a very interesting additional piece of information is that um, the opposite logics also works. So whenever you have um, a, a causal horizon, okay, you may revert the logics and rederive Einstein's equations of motion as the associated 
equation of state for that uh, thermodynamical system. So that's a proof which has been made, I think, in the uh, mid-late 90s by Jacobson, which shows that these, this, these steps are actually equi uh, equivalences and not one-way directions. Good. So, to run a long story short, in, uh, in this way of looking into, onto black holes, we now have that entropy as an interpretation as being related to the horizon area and temperature as being related to the surface gravity. Now, of course, the question we are after now is to figure out how quantum gravitational effects could possibly modify uh, the physics of such a system. Okay, and so the question you would, I mean, that's, that's a challenge for any any quantum theory of gravity, whatever your favorite model is, okay, you would want to understand how this is going to affect the various aspects of, amongst others, black hole physics. Yes. So, the questions which are central for us will be, what is the fate of curvature singularities? What happens with temperature of such objects? Can we still define in a meaningful way temperature? Yes. What is the fate of black hole thermodynamics in the first place? Okay. Are these relations going to persist or is this just an artifact of a too simple approximation for gravity? Okay. Yes. Now, and possibly, okay, I mean, but that would be a tiny bit speculative, but still, yes, you might ask yourself, is, is there something like a notion of a quantum black hole? Okay. Good. So this will be our motivation. Now, the way we'd like to do that is uh, we want to go back to um, the work by uh, Gibbons and Hawking. Okay, so what uh, Gibbons and Hawking in 77 derived from a Euclidean path integral, uh, so to speak, um, uh, the thermodynamic relationships which where we were after. Now, we also would like to start with a Euclidean path integral, but the difference will be that we assume that it's not simply given by uh, the classical action. So what I've written down for you here is an effective action gamma, which contains a Ricci scala, yes, and maybe an abelian uh, f mu nu squared with, uh, uh, with a u1 coupling alpha. Okay. So if in these objects we would just have replace G by Newton's coupling and alpha, say, by the fine structure constant measured in experiments, then uh, the stationary points, solutions to these equations of motions, will give us, of course, the Kerr solutions we've discussed a minute ago. So far, so good. Also, those are very well known. For those, uniqueness theorems apply. Excellent. Now, the difference we'd like to put in here is we want to take the notion of running couplings a bit more seriously and we want to allow G as well as possibly alpha to become running couplings which depend on momentum uh, RG momentum scales K. So unlike a conventional classical action this action gamma index K has now uh, the interpretation of being a flowing infective action whose parameters change with the renormalization group's evolution of scales. So the view here will be that this action gamma k, if since k has a Wilsonian interpretation, it means that if k is large, only those momentum modes between uh, highest energies and k have been integrated out, but all the effects from uh, fluctuations below this momentum cut of K have not yet been included. So this would mean that this effective action here at fixed K does not yet know much about the fluctuations of low energy modes with momenta smaller than K. But it should know everything about uh, the momentum modes larger than K. So if we send, if we have a way of sending K to zero that would then mean that in the underlying path integral we have integrated out the fluctuations of all momentum modes. So then we would end up with the full quantum effective action of our theory. Okay. 
So, so in that sense, gamma k has an interpolating property. It would allow us to interpolate between a high, energy, a high energy effective action where k takes very large values and where, k, where gamma may possibly be different from just uh, the simple form to which we have approximated he it here and the classical limit uh, at low energies. Good. So this is going to be our starting point. And the way we'd like to exploit uh, uh, this effective action is to say, okay, we allow that these couplings may run. We don't want, as of yet, to put in a prejudice as to how they run. Okay? But we want to find some way of thinking about an action where these couplings can run. That's uh, what we'd like to do. Okay, so we, so in a sense, we assume that somebody can give us these functions, g of k and alpha of k. Later on, I will be uh, specifying those, but not at this stage. Now, if we do this, what are we going to find? What we are going to find is we, of course, now allow running parameters. We still look for stationary solutions of this effective action. So you will end up with a family of Kerr-Newman black holes where uh, the area of black holes is again given by a function of the mass, angular momentum and charge of your black hole. The only difference, however, being that now um, this relation will also implicitly depend on the RG momentum scale k. Simply because the couplings G and alpha inside this relation are going to depend on K uh, themselves. And furthermore, the other thing we already know by just doing this particular step is that the entropy okay, is now going to be the area divided by 4G, but G evaluated at that RG momentum scale K. Okay? Good. So now we have a solution. So we have a family of solutions, and uh, which we can read as uh, uh, well a family of solutions as a function of k. So now the big question is: At which k do we have to evaluate our effective action? So we, okay. So our question, which yes, the question we have to deal with now is. What do we know about this RG momentum scale K? Now this is the input we are making. So the main physics assumption which we are splicing into the system is that K, so the RG momentum scale down to which we should integrate out the underlying quantum fluctuations of the metric field and maybe the photon field in the effective action of which we use to get a saddle point solution to then describe a black hole of a certain mass m with angular momentum j and charge q. Okay, So we will assume that k must be a function of these macroscopic parameters which afterwards describe our black hole. Why do charges depend on the scale? Because the fine structure constant uh, evolves under the renormalization group. But charges are something measured. You are in asymptotically flat space and you measure them from infinity. So I would say charges are uh, very, very infrared, they at k equal to zero. Yes, but we have a theory in which, um, besides Newton's coupling, which. Def you see, uh, in, in charged black hole solutions, Okay. Also, uh, obviously, the charge. So th those black hole solutions know about Newton's coupling, but they know also know about the fine structure constant. And the solution is quantitatively different if the fine structure constant has a different value. So it is the fine structure constant which you have to measure in a lab once, 
But then whether you measure it on one meter scales or on LHC energy scales, you will find a different value for the fine structure constant. So then you have to ask yourself which value to plug into uh, um, this back hole solution. Okay. So for that reason, yes, we would want to take, I mean, it's a small effect and it's not relevant, not centrally relevant to our point here, okay? But in principle, yes, if you take this reasoning seriously, you would want to uh, retain such effects in your analysis. I guess uh, maybe another way to think about that is that in, in, in your action, in your black hole solution, take the mass, you always see G newtons times the mass, and that's what an asymptotic observer would measure. Then he would have to divide that by whatever he calls Newton's constant. So, I mean, if you allow one of the two to run, I guess it's the same, I think, because you just make another experiment that determines Newton's constant and just get some. <coughs> okay, so the, so, as I said, our main physics assumption here will be that uh, we will assume that uh, a choice of K, yes, um, so, for the other way, K should at best depend on those physical parameters which describe the black hole we are after at the very end. So, in a sense, you can imagine imagine your black hole is arbitrarily big. Okay? Yes? So, if the mass goes to infinity, technically, quantum gravity corrections will be suppressed. So in the mass to infinity limit, you would expect that you would end up with strictly the classical solution. Okay? So in the mass to infinity limit, you would expect that, that K, so the scale down to which you would want to integrate out your modes, yes, effectively goes to zero. Okay? So if the mass is very big, yes, you would expect that you need uh, um, very many have to integrate out very many modes in order to end up with a good approximation for your uh, effective action gamma index k to be able to describe the corresponding mm -hmm. uh, effective action. Whereas if your, quant if your black hole is very small, maybe you need less information, you need less, you have to integrate out less quantum gravity fluctuations into the effective action whose settle point approximation then is going to describe a low mass black hole. So this is, this is in a sense the rationale for why you definitely would expect that these things depend on mass, angular momentum and charge as well. Because these are the only macroscopic parameters which at the end of the day will carry information about your black hole. Good. This is our assumption. Okay, let's plug this assumption into our equations. How do we do it? We redo the thought experiment of Bekenstein. Okay? So we say, okay, let's assume that somebody gives us a black hole of a certain mass, angular momentum, charge, and so let's take an electron and throw it into that black hole. And let's look how um, um, the parameters of the black hole are now going to change. Okay? So the mass will change by a certain amount, angular momentum will change, charge will change, and also the RG scale at which we will have to evaluate our effective action will change by a small amount. So, let's now write this into the total change of the horizon area. And what you find is the following equation. So we are now only exploiting the thermodynamic relationships, yes, uh, um, uh, w w which we've derived previously. So in this case, we see that the change in the horizon area is given by 2 pi over temp temperature over kappa times the, that change plus an additional term. So this, this would be it had there been no RG corrections. Okay? This, term, this term is the new term arising because of us playing games with the RG scale. So a normal, the normal setup of that term is away and then this is the trivial statement that classical temperature is given by kappa over 2 pi. But now there's a new term arising which knows about uh, the RG scale dependence inside the area relation. Okay, so this new term is now induced and this new term will result into small modifications of, for example, black hole temperature or 
the black hole state function. Good. But the most important thing, the most important point here is that if we do this, for this to be a consistent equation, okay, we need that the variation of the Rg scale k yes, must be proportional to the variation of the area, or else we cannot solve this equation. If this is not the case, then there is no thermodynamically consistent description of that system, because we can no longer solve this equation. Okay? So, delta kappa, uh, delta k here, must be proportional to delta a. Okay, so now, now we have a choice. Okay? So as I said in the beginning, actually we don't know whether laws of black hole thermodynamics survive under quantum gravity corrections. Yes? But here, since we splice in such ideas, we can make the choice and say, okay, let's see what happens if we impose this. So if we want to impose thermodynamic, uh, these thermodynamic laws to persist even under smallest quantum corrections, then we must have delta K being proportional to delta A. Yes, we've, we've used, we've, there, there are various ways you can write it down and we try to find a reasonably simple one wi without looking totally redundant. Okay, and so the way, to, the way to look at it is that T is this, is, this is, this is the modification term which arises due to the RG scale. Forget about the modification Then the meaning of the equation is that the temperature must be kappa over 2 pi. Which this is then this is then a different this will then be you have your thermodynamic relations those you c you can insert into each other and you normally derive that way the temperature is kappa over two pi as we did previously okay so now you will see that uh, the yes entropy we have defined here yeah. Okay, and so uh, what happens here is that um, temperature will no longer be just, I mean, there will be a correction to temperature in this derivation of, uh, um, of the relation, and you will see that temperature is no longer formally given by kappa over 2 pi, but there are correction terms. I still don't understand this equation. Is it the first law just written in some structure? We have we, now we have, we've put we've put several equations into each other. So we massaged, we exploited the first law, and we also exploited uh, um, implicitly this definition. So I mean, this is where, where your statement uh, that, that the second part should be proportional to delta a comes from. Because yes. Just remove delta a and then see this as a definition of the temperature. Is that what you meant when you said that the the correction is proportional to delta a? For this equation to have a solution, we must have delta k proportional to delta a. Because then we can solve this equation and we know what the temperature will be. We can solve it. Okay? If this term is not here, we can solve it trivially and we know that the temperature is surface, essentially surface gravity. Okay? Now we have our g corrections in the system. Yes. Now, uh, there will be correction terms, but the system will be, we will be able to solve this system provided that this term is proportional to delta A, because then we will get an equation in the first place. Good. So, if we do this, this is what comes out. So, first of all, what comes out is that uh, K, since the variation... so. The point is that K, our input was that K should depend on mass, angular momentum, and charge. Now, thermodynamic consistency, as we just argued, so that the equation I wrote down has a solution, requires that K must be a function of A only. So, K can depend on Mj and Q only through the function A of Mj and Q. And then dimensional analysis tells you that this function, K, Yes, in four dimensions, I mean, it's just like essentially one over the area with some proportionality constant, which our line of reasoning is not going to fix. So this parameter xi 
okay, is some number of order one, which, however, cannot be fixed by this reasoning. Good. Now, once we have this, we can now write down, uh, well, mass functions or thermodynamic relations. So the simplest way of writing these equations down is to express the mass of the black hole as a function of the area, angular momentum and charge. And what you see here is uh, the new thing which in these classical relations are not appearing is that now G Newton has become a function of the area, okay, which remember itself is a function of mj and q, via the identification of the Rg scale k with k opt of a given up here. Okay, so it's in this way that an additional uh, dependence enters into the game. So this means that although we have started with equations whose solutions look like classical black holes due to this scale identification, after scale identification, these solutions are qualitatively different from classical black hole solutions. So um, there's one limit in which they approach classical black holes, and that's the large mass limit. If a, class, if a black hole has a very large mass, obviously, then the quantum corrections are suppressed, and you can... So, for example, one, one way for seeing it is like to see, okay, if, if the area is getting very big, yes, then we see that if the area is getting very big, the Rg scale down to which we integrate is going to zero, okay, then G will be replaced by its classical value, uh, the U1 charge as well, okay? And so the implicit A dependence then will drop out. These are then just numbers, and this relation will fall back onto the classical relation. On the other hand, yes, if you have finite size black holes or if you have order one corrections to, to these couplings, yes, there will be modifications. So let's have a look into those. Yes? Um, and to have an explicit look into it, we now have to make some assumption about how the RG running looks like. Okay, so as I said, uh, up, to, up to this slide, I have not made an explicit assumption about how the RG running explicitly looks like. Yes, I've only exploited my assumption that uh, um, an effective action of some sort is available whose subtle point uh, we are trying to evaluate. Good. But now to get something out of these equations, I have to make an input. So I will now make the assumption that, the, that Newton's coupling as a function of energy scale k is having a certain behavior. So this behavior is motivated by studies of asymptotically safe gravity. And it's, it's a very simple type of model mimicking precisely the asymptotic safety behavior of a running Newton coupling. So as you can see here, if the Rg momentum scale k is very small, this term is subleading, and the running coupling is just given by Newton's coupling. Good. Classical gravity. On the other hand, as soon as k is getting larger, this term ultimately will take over, and then G Newton, rather than being uh, a constant, is going to decrease, and it will become very weak. So the effect which we are splicing in is that gravity is going to weaken towards larger momentum scales. Good. Now, what is the output? So the first thing is, what you notice just from this equation is that for small k, we have classical gravity. For large k, we have fixed point gravity. So there's a characteristic energy scale, okay, given by the fixed point value times roughly the Planck scale where a crossover happens, where Newton's coupling, which previously was just a constant, will start uh, to scale in a specific form. Okay, so it's at this energy scale where something characteristic and game-changing is taking place in our model. Fine. Now, so this comes just from the RG equation. Now the second output this equation here, this is something which comes from now evaluating this mass function. So now we plug the equation we just got into this mass function and look into its solutions. And unlike 
what you know from classical black hole solutions, which for, no, for the non-rotating case at least, yes, can have arbitrarily small mass, yes, <coughs> now you realize, no, these black hole solutions no longer can have an arbitrarily small mass. So there's a lower mass appearing, and this lower mass, which I call MC, is given by 1 over G star, where G star is the fixed point value, times the Planck scale. Okay? So this is, this is, in a sense, a non-perturbative effect arising through this RG running. Okay? There's an interesting duality between these two scales, as you can see, because if you multiply them with each other, the fixed point value drops out, and uh, their product is just, again, the infrared uh, Planck scale. The infrared value, f the infrared estimate for the Planck scale. Good. Now, let's look into uh, this a little bit more explicitly. Uh, what is this? Something is not okay. Let me have a quick look. What have I done? Oh no. Okay. Good. Good. So now you can go on and say, okay, fine. So there's something like a new phenomenon, a smallest black hole mass. Okay. So the physics, now how would you intuitively justify that? Okay? You would say, of course, you have spliced into your system information about gravity according to which gravity now gets weak, more we is more weakly coupled at, higher, at, at, at shorter distances. Okay? So the so heuristic interpretation is that, of course, uh, if gravity is very weakly coupled at shorter distances, then, of course, it's no longer strong enough to generate a horizon. And so, therefore, there is there. Uh, so, this is then the reason for why there is a m smallest mass for which a horizon still exists. But if you now try to lump matter, sm a small amount of matter, yes, then on such short distances, gravity will no longer be strong enough to generate a horizon. Okay. So, this is this is the physics interpretation for the existence of this uh, mass M C. Good. So what you now can also do is you can say, okay, I use my state function and compute from the state function the temperature. And remember, we argued for a little while uh, that there are corrections to temperature arising because of our modifi modified equations. And here you see quantitatively how that looks like. So what I've plotted here, the black curves are Schwarzschild, no rotation. So we all know four-dimensional Schwarzschild black hole <coughs> has a diverging temperature, the, okay, and the mass would be able to go to zero, and uh, uh, the Schwarzschild black hole would classically become arbitrarily hot. Now that we've allowed quantum gravity corrections in a specific way to kick in, what we find is instead that the temperature displays a maximum. Yes, a question. I was just wondering, maybe I don't quite understand it, but if you change the temperature through the thermodynamics, I mean, what about the Hawking radiation? You can go through field theory arguments and calculate the temperature, and usually those two should match. Yes, they do. And so is it only because you change the math? I mean, how does this, what is exactly causing, is there a physics understanding what's causing this, this change in the temperature? I mean, I mean, I can <coughs> see how, it seems to me that the field theory side would stay exactly the same. Or perhaps an alternative way, which, which I will mention a little bit later, um, if I manage, <laughs> is to l think of what surface gravity is. Okay? If, if you think of a space-time with certain properties, okay? in, in the Hawking picture, it is the surface gravity which governs uh, the temperature, because these two are related. Okay? So the point which, in a way, people are making in this field is that the surface gravity gets quantum correct corrections to it. And these corrections make the surface gravity smaller, which means that the temperature actually, instead of rising, always rising with decreasing mass, the surface gravity of the corresponding effective uh, uh, black hole space-times yes, have a lowered surface gravity, so therefore the temperature is smaller. 
I, I will make that link in, in hopefully seven minutes or so. Good. But you see, this is a fairly striking feature. Yes? So, uh, and this feature comes partly about because we have a smallest, uh, a critical mass MC for smallest black hole. This black hole has vanishing temperature, so in one way or another the, this curve must come down uh, back here. Now, in a way, in a way, this is not totally surprising. So why is it not totally surprising? Well, we already know from rotating classical black holes that rotation as a purely kinematical effect can lift the degeneracy of Schwarzschild black holes. Okay? So if you think of a Schwarzschild black hole and you shake it a bit, give it a little bit of rotation, then already this classical black hole will get two horizons, an outer one and an inner one. Okay? And as soon as you allow rotation in a classical black hole, yes, what you will see is that there is the famous Kerr bound, which gives you the smallest classical black hole if rotation is switched on. So here I have shown you a plot for a rotating black hole spacetime, a classical, classically rotating black hole spacetime, which also has, you know, a smallest mass for horizon to exist. But here, this is a purely kinematical effect in the classical model. Now, if you then switch on the quantum gravity corrections I've discussed, these corrections look much softer. Okay? So this doesn't look like a very substantial change. Okay? Whereas the substantial change, I mean, this change looks much more substantial in a Schwarzschild because the, Schwa the classical Schwarzschild is not yet having an inner horizon. Okay? So, and the reason for this, one other way of looking at this is to notice that a classical Schwarzschild black hole is kind of uh, at a bifurcation point. It has not yet quite bifurcated into a, into a black hole which has inner and outer horizons, but once you shake it a tiny bit, be it by throwing charge into it, throwing angular momentum in it, or adding quantum corrections, whoop, instantaneously you will get in our horizon. Okay? So it's a, it's a conceivable feature yes, that this type of inner horizon will occur. Now, but the quantitative change from having an inner horizon or not is much more pronounced for Schwarzschild than for rotating black hole. So we see here the quantum gravity corrections are much more moderate. Yes? So this is like, okay, A is a... a uh, angular momentum in units of the black hole mass. Good. Now, another thing which, okay, is always interesting to look at is the specific heat. Yes, so we know that classical Schwarzschild black holes, yes, they are actually thermodynamically unstable. Yes, they radiate away energy and they get hotter. <laughs> um, amazing system, yes. Yes, so we, we don't have very many systems of this type in nature. Um, Yes, so specific heat is negative. Yes, however, as soon as we allow quantum gravity corrections, yes, there is a point, so a characteristic mass, where suddenly the specific heat changes sign. So here, classical black hole, non-rotating, negative specific heat. Here, quantum gravity corrections, whoop, specific heat gets very large, but then changes sign through a pole. Okay. Now remember, we, we are all very happy that specific heat is very large because this is one of the control parameters for a thermodynamical description of a black hole to be applicable. Yes. So we do think that once specific heat is getting very, very small, like here or here, then probably even the thermodynamical model is likely to no longer be reliable. But here it should be uh, uh, do its job reasonably well. Good. So. Let me now come. Can, can I ask a question? Of course. A quick one. Yes. Because now, I mean, the prediction is so basically, because the hope is that maybe you can see walking radiation or so primordial black holes, but now you put the bound on it. If this bound is very, very low, which means that we put it again out of the observational window or any hope to. What is the temperature? What is the maximum temperature? So the maximum temperature in these, look, you have to understand that these are somewhat model computations, okay? But typically what you find is that the maximum temperature is uh, below Planck temperature. Ah, so it's, so it's non, high, high. it's high, but it's mm -hmm. not Planck temperature. Yes, maybe a tenth or, 
or a hundredth rough yes of the Planck temperature. So the same with black hole radiates until it gets to this small size and then the radiation gets weaker and weaker and it kind of stops? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Now uh, I have, however, I have to put a disclaimer to that, which is the specific heat argument. Okay, so the smaller, so because once the specific heat is positive, the guy radiates and gets colder. It gets colder again, so it radiates slower and so on and so on. Technically, on paper, it has an infinite lifetime. Okay, now whether you can trust that extrapolation or not, okay, I, I would, I don't know whether we should trust that, because if the black hole is getting very cold, kind of it may very well be that you, you know it may just emit a last quanta and then it is gone, okay, rather than continuously emitting lower and lower and lower quanta, okay. But because specific heat is already so small, we can no longer uh, honestly to God, so to speak, think of it as a thermodynamical ensemble which is radiating the way we normally think about ho rock Hawking radiation. But okay, so, so, it so it certainly stop. If this happens in finite time, the horizon is gone, <coughs> Hawking radiation is switched. Yes, but in this model it would technically not happen in finite time. Um. That's the point. But Okay, so technically it doesn't happen in finite time. But the point I'm making is that uh, the model assumptions we are using in order to perform uh, this analysis cease to be good approximation in the regime where the specific heat is getting very, very small. Okay, so then, so then um, perhaps a different look into those equations is definitely needed. Good. So, how am I doing with time? Probably very bad. Can the chair, please. Another five minutes. Another five minutes. Excellent. Good. So let me have a quick look on. Um, so I've prepared a few things I wanted to talk about. Um, so maybe I can uh, now. I would like to perhaps talk about two more things. Okay. One is a brief comment, which I will make at the very end. And the second one is an entirely different line of thinking, uh, but I think worth displaying, and it is related to the notion of conformal scaling. So there's an old argument um, uh, by these gentlemen, Aaron and Banks, and which later on by Schoma has been brought up again in the literature, uh, which often is used um, um, in order to have, have a, a framework um, to argue for why a local quantum field theory of the metric field couldn't possibly be fundamental. And the argument runs as follows. The argument is, if a local quantum field theory is fundamental, that as highest energies, it must behave like a conformal field theory. So we know a couple of things about conformal field theories at highest energies. So in particular, entropy scales like radius times temperature to a certain power if it is a field theory in d dimensions and energy scales in a particular form uh, in a conformal field theory. So if one were to be taking these two equations and I'm now repeating the argument of these gentlemen uh, then you can write down uh, how entropy must scale with energy and you can compute the power nu. What you find is that for this to be compatible with a conformal field theory, that this power must be d minus 1. Okay. Now, um, what you then can do is you can say, okay, let's look into how our famous Schwarzschild black hole yes, would behave at highest energies, and then, then you would say, of course, yes, the entropy of a Schwarzschild black hole scales with a certain power of the radius, yes, uh, divided by Newton's coupling, the energy to a different power. So of course we can instantaneously compute the power with which entropy must scale, which is this number. Okay. So the conclusion uh, which is typically made is that uh, since these two numbers uh, are not the same and actually they are not they are the same except in, in three over two dimensions, then there is no integer dimensionality yes, in which quantum gravity of which we expect it to be dominated by black holes in highest en at highest energies could be described by a conformal field theory. Good. So, with my student Kevin Falls, uh, we looked again into this argument some time back. <coughs> and 
Uh, our view is that this argument perhaps should be revisited in the following manner. So the first point we wanted to make is that rather than talking about the entropy and the energy to obey a certain relation, we think it's more appropriate and uh, mathematically correct to talk about energy density in units, uh, sorry, entropy density in units as a function of energy density. Okay, because in this case you ensure that temperature is going to be held fixed in your entire system. Now, if you look into this particular relation, you will still find that the exponent nu is d minus 1 over d, which is exactly the same number okay, we've seen in the previous estimate. However, if you now apply this very same reasoning to Schwarzschild, what do you find? You find 1 half. Don't find d minus 2 over d minus 3. You find 1 half. Good. Now, why do you find 1 half? Okay, yes. Why do you find 1 half? We now have a very simple explanation for this one half, which is the following. In a Schwarzschild black hole, we still have one dimensionful parameter, which is G Newton. Okay? That's the only other dimensionful quantity existing in the scaling relations. Okay? So therefore it is crystal clear that your scaling relation under no circumstances can obey conformal scaling because the relation, the quantity itself, depends on a dimensionful parameter except in two dimensions. In two dimensions, Newton's coupling has vanishing canonical mass dimension. So in two dimensions, G Newton is just a number. Okay? And formally these relations would then no longer depend on a dimensionful parameter. So now go back to your equation and plug d equal 2 into this relation and you will see, aha, the conformal field theory result exactly reproduces this one half as it must because, yes, only in that case uh, dimension, further dimensionful parameters are removed from the system. Okay, so that's observation number one. So now we understand these numbers. But the next point is, let's now try to understand Okay, what happens at high energies? And in this case, I will be focusing on our asymptotically safe black hole. At high energies, if I now analyze the equations which we have derived uh, 10 minutes ago using thermodynamical considerations, so I analyze the mass function for these black holes and I take the corresponding limits, yes, what I find is that at high energies, entropy becomes a constant. Energy scales with the Rg scale, the radius of the black hole with 1 over Rg scale, and temperature with the Rg scale. No further reference to a dimensionful parameter because the dimensionful parameter has dropped out of the system since at high energies k we are sitting at a fixed point. So G Newton as a dimensionful parameter is no longer present in the system. So that, that's the limit where an asymptotically safe black hole has the chance of reflecting conformal scaling. Yes, of course. Okay, good. Yes, uh, I wrap up. So, let me just show you the result. So this is what comes out if you compute it. So we can compute this index nu, this here, and we see that it interpolates between the black hole, the classical Schwarzschild black hole value for large radii, and it crosses over to the conformal field theory value at small values of uh, the black hole. So there's no discrepancy with conformal scaling in this model. Uh, so let me kind of, okay, I had a few things, a few more things prepared. Uh, let me put up the conclusions maybe. Okay, so um, what I have not shown to you is uh, one slide <coughs> where I show that what we've done based on thermodynamical considerations has a one-to-one -one match based on considerations using renormalization group improved space times. So we have a one-to-one -one map between these two things, okay, which, which builds confidence in that the main features of black holes which we have discovered uh, in this model, okay, are stable. Of course more work is uh, required to extend these studies um, to include more higher order correction terms, but um, since I'm running a tiny bit out of time, yes, I, yes, okay, so I, I, I stop right now, thank you very much.